Hey everyone, my name's Trevor and this is a quick start tutorial on how FMOD works and how to use it to create adaptive audio for video games. You don't need to know anything about FMOD before watching this video and the goal here is for you to walk away with both the knowledge to get started using FMOD and a general idea of the things you can do with FMOD. And just as a quick disclaimer, this isn't an all-inclusive tutorial. We'll cover the core concepts and key features of FMOD that I think are important to understanding it as a whole, but we won't be digging into audio engineering heavy topics or more niche or advanced features, because I think it's better to naturally discover and learn about those as you need them. And with all of that said, let's get right into it. FMOD is an application used for organizing, managing, and interacting with video game audio. One thing that makes it stand out, and the main reason you may want to use it, is that it specializes in creating what's referred to as adaptive audio. Adaptive audio just means the audio needs to change or adapt according to things that are happening within the video game. One example of this could be having the volume of a sound play louder when the player gets closer to a specific location while another example could be having a heartbeat sound play more intensely as a player's health gets lower, and yet another example could be making footstep sounds sound different depending on what the player is walking on. All of those examples and many more can be accomplished in an elegant way using FMOD. With that said, even if you don't really care about the adaptive audio features that FMOD offers, it can still be an excellent way to organize, manage, and interact with your game's audio, but adaptive audio is certainly FMOD's selling point, and FMOD is somewhat of an industry standard when dealing with video game audio, with a huge roster of companies and games that have used it. FMOD Studio, which is the main application, can be downloaded from FMOD's official website. And likewise, as of making this video, FMOD has direct support for Unity, Unreal Engine 4, and Unreal Engine 5 in the form of integration plugins. If you're using something other than Unity or Unreal Engine, you can still integrate your game with FMOD through the FMOD Engine Runtime API, but of course, it'll be more work to do so. That said, some of the more popular game engines, like Godot for example, have some community-made integrations that can help with this. I'll link a couple of these in the description of this video for Godot in particular. I won't be covering any specific integrations in this tutorial, so if you want to follow along with anything later on in this video, all you need to download is FMOD Studio. As for pricing, as of making this video, FMOD is free to use for non-commercial use and for indie developers with less than $200,000 in revenue per year on under a $500,000 development budget. However, it does cost a fee if your revenue or development budget are higher than that. Be sure to check out their pricing page for the most up-to-date information. Now before we jump into actually using FMOD, I think it's worth understanding how it works and how a game is meant to interact with it. Typically, you'll have a single FMOD project that corresponds to your game project, and all of your audio files will be stored in the FMOD project. For each piece of audio that the game needs to play, you'll create what FMOD calls an event. An event can be anything from a single sound to a collection of sounds with varying effects and internal logic. For example, for a footsteps event, it might be made up of multiple sound clips, each representing a single footstep that sounds a bit different, where logic within that event will randomly choose a footstep sound to play each time the event is played. An event can also be parameterized if we choose to do so, where the sound for that event varies in some way depending on the value of that parameter or parameters. For the footsteps example, we could add a parameter called echo as a value between 0 and 1. Then we can change that parameter where the closer we get to 1, the more the footstep sound will echo when we play the event. The benefit here is that we can control the value of any parameter from the game code, so we can properly adapt that echo parameter to be higher or lower depending on where the player is in the game. Each event is assigned to something called a bank, which I'll cover in more detail later in this video, but for now, just think of a bank as a collection of a bunch of events of some similar type. And next, for your game to be able to interact with your FMOD project, you'll need to build the FMOD project first. When you build an FMOD project, it's taking each bank and compiling those down in a way the game code can interact with them. So to sum things up, anything related to the audio itself, which includes logic like looping audio, randomizing audio, audio by distance, varying effects, and much more, are usually best handled within FMOD. And the game code mostly just cares about when to call a specific event to play the corresponding audio, as well as any parameter values needed to adapt those events to what's going on in the game. In addition to that, most things in the FMOD project can be accessed through the game code as needed, allowing the game code to do things like control the volume, change things about the overall mix, and much more. And that's it for a really high level overview of how FMOD works and how a game will interact with it. Next, let's jump into FMOD Studio and check things out. As mentioned earlier in the video, FMOD Studio can be downloaded from their official website, and after that we can open it up and select the New Project button to create a new empty project. 
Before we do anything else, we'll need to import some sound files that we can play around with. In FMOD, raw sound files are referred to as assets and can be imported into the project by clicking on the Assets tab and then dragging in any sound files that we want to use into that window. Or if you prefer, you could also import sound files by going to File and then Import Assets. When you first install FMOD, it comes with a sample project called Examples, and for this video, we're just going to drag in everything from the Assets directory of that Examples project. Depending on your operating system, you'll have to look around for where this project is located, however for me on Windows it's in my documents slash fmod studio directory. So we'll drag all of those in and I'll delete the other two sound files that we dragged in previously by highlighting them, hitting the delete button on my keyboard, and then confirming that in this pop-up menu. Now that we have some assets imported, let's create an event. After selecting the events tab, we can right click and scroll over new event and we have a few options here. Of course, you'll want to go with 2D if you're working on audio for a 2D game and 3D if you're working on audio for a 3D game, but you also have the option between an action and a timeline. First, let's select new 2D action, which will create an event starting with an action sheet, and we'll just leave the name as new event. An action is great for things like one-shot sounds that just need to play once right at the start of the event and don't require any concept of time. From the assets tab, we can drag out the UI cancel sound to add that to the event and then hit play we'll see that it simply plays the sound and nothing more. And if we drag in another sound, like the UI OK sound, we'll see that it plays each sound consecutively one after another. That's because of this drop down here that says consecutive, and if we change that to concurrent and play it again, they'll both play at the same time instead. So that's an action sheet, but now back in the events tab, let's create another new event and choose the new 2D timeline option, which will create a new event starting with a timeline sheet instead. Just like before, we'll drag out the UI cancel sound from our assets directory into this section here, which is called a track. And we'll also drag out the UI OK sound into that same track and we'll position it to be directly after the UI cancel sound. And since we're a bit zoomed out, we can use the open and close bracket key shortcuts to zoom in or out so we can see the timeline more clearly. On a timeline, sheet, this top area corresponds to time, so if we play the event, the sound clips play in order like you might expect. But if we wanted these sounds to partly overlap with each other, what we could do is right click on the left side of the track, select add audio track to add another track, and then drag this second sound onto the new track and position it where it overlaps somewhat with the first sound. And now when we play the event, we'll see that both overlap a bit just as we'd expect. One last thing to note here is that an event can have a mix of both a single timeline and any number of actions. We can add sheets to an event by clicking this plus sign here and selecting the type of sheet we want to add. We can only have one timeline, which is why it doesn't show up as an option in this event, but if we select our other event that doesn't have a timeline sheet yet, the option will show up there. And we can also have something called a parameter sheet, but we're going to cover that later in this video, so don't worry about that for right now. I'm going to remove the first event we created and the action sheets we added to the second event so that we just have a single single event with a timeline sheet that contains a couple of tracks. There are a lot of things we can do in a timeline sheet, and if we right click on this black bar at the top, we'll get a bunch of options. If we want this section to loop indefinitely when the event is played, we can select add loop region and then stretch this blue bar out for the section that we want to loop, where anything before that section will play and only the section within the blue bar will loop. And if we want to remove anything from the top of this timeline, we can just select it and press the delete key to delete it. Similar to a loop, a magnet region will also loop a section, however the event will jump straight to the beginning of that section no matter where we start in the timeline. Next, a sustain point will cause the playback to pause at whatever location it's placed at, and it will remain paused there until your game code tells the event to continue through the FMOD API. This can be a good option if you need to halt an event until something happens within the game. Next, the destination marker and region as well as the transition and transition region can all be used to hop around the timeline in different ways. For example, we'll add a destination marker here and a transition marker here. Then we'll click on the transition marker under transition conditions, we can choose the marker A that we added, and if we play the event, when it hits the transition marker it jumps straight to the destination marker as we specified. The main benefit of using these is that you can add conditions to them with parameters and then control those parameters from the game to jump around the event while it's playing. And the difference between the markers and the regions is that the markers cover a single point on the timeline, whereas the regions will stretch over a range. And the last thing we can add to a timeline is a tempo marker, which just specifies the tempo and time signature for the event. This makes it where the beats will be accurate for that tempo and time signature, and of course you can toggle between time and beats up here. This is great because if you're doing something like looping a music track, 
track, you'll want the loop to cleanly line up with the track's timing, which is much easier to do when the tempo and time signature are correct. And of course, we can combine a bunch of these to make the event play however we want it to. But I'm going to delete all of these for now. We've been referring to these two blue rectangles as sound clips up until now, but the correct term according to FMOD is actually calling these instruments. An instrument refers to some content in an event that either plays some audio or triggers something else in the project, and FMOD has a wide variety of different instrument types. Each one of these is a single instrument, which essentially means that it's just a single sound. We'll delete both of these as well as the bottom track, and then we can right click on the timeline section to see a bunch of different instrument options. As mentioned, a single instrument instrument is what those were before, and that's what FMOD creates by default when you drag in an asset. A multi-instrument is just how it sounds. Instead of a single sound file, it allows for multiple sound files with some options for how to play them. To see how this works, let's select that one, and then in the Assets tab, we can go to Character, Footsteps, and drag all three of these enemy footstep sounds into the multi-instrument. We can also resize it a bit if we want to, and it's important to note that resizing it doesn't actually modify the sound speed or anything like that, which can be a bit confusing, especially especially if you're used to working in audio or video editing software. Because this is its own self-contained instrument, the size of it only affects when it'll play on the timeline and doesn't affect anything related to the actual assets. This makes more sense the more you use FMOD, so don't worry if that's a bit confusing at first. Anyways, with the multi-instrument selected, the configuration for it will show up in this playlist section at the bottom. If we play the event right now, it'll shuffle through each sound randomly because we have shuffle selected in this dropdown. The difference between shuffle and randomize is that in randomize it has the possibility to repeat a sound twice in a row, whereas in shuffle it doesn't. Next, sequential is just how it sounds, where it'll play them in order from first to last. Local versus global is just taking into account the event instance, which basically just means the instance in which that event was played. You can think of it like each time the event is being played, whether that be through FMOD or the game's code, it's starting a new event instance to play the sound. In global, every event instance is taken into account, which means it'll be sequential every time we play it, regardless of a single event instance. Whereas in local, it takes into account the single event instance, which is why when we play it, it just plays the first sound over and over again, unless we loop it, in which case it'll now play them sequentially because it's now using the same event instance. Next, an event instrument can be used to play a referenced event as part of another event. You'll see that when we created the event instrument, a nested event also got created, which will be the one that's referenced with that instrument. So if we set up that nested event to play a sound, and then we play the parent event, we'll see that it references that nested event and plays the sound we just set up. Something to note about nested events is that we won't be able to reference those nested events from our game code, but instead you'd play the parent event which can reference the nested event. Likewise, if we had another event already created that we wanted to reference, we could just drag it into the timeline and it'll add that entire event to our timeline as an event instrument. Next, a scatterer instrument is a lot like the multi-instrument in that it's meant to be able to play multiple sounds in different ways, however it has some more advanced options on how it plays those sounds, mostly dealing with frequency. For example, we'll drag in these bird sounds under ambience, birds, and to really see how this works, we'll also zoom out and drag this out over a larger time range. Then we can play the event, and we'll see that as we change the spawn rate closer to zero, sounds play less frequently. And as we increase the spawn rate, sounds play more frequently. So the scatterer instrument is a great choice when you have a combination of sounds that you want to play randomly, but also care about the frequency in which they play. Next is the programmer instrument, which shows up as empty in the timeline, but it's actually generating a callback function that can be used from your game code to play any kind of sound, whether it exists in the FMOD project or not. This can be great if you have audio that might be better managed outside of the FMOD project for any reason. I'm not going to go into this one any further though in this video, since that starts to get into integration details for whatever game engine you're using. Next, a command instrument can be used to trigger something within your FMOD project that normally your game code would trigger, so things like playing events, stopping events, and changing parameters. For example, we can create another event to play, and then we can configure the command instrument to play that other event. 
And last, we're going to skip over snapshot instruments for now, but we'll cover them later in this video. And plugin instruments can allow the use of custom plugins, but we're not going to dig into that at all. So that's it for the different instruments FMOD has, and next we're going to talk about effects. Effects can be applied to each track in the timeline sheet individually by clicking on that track, or if you want them to apply to every track in the timeline sheet, you can click on the master track and then apply the effects there. So with this first track clicked on, we can apply an effect either before or after the volume filter is applied by right-clicking and going to Add Effect. There are a bunch of options here, and I'm not going to cover each one. If you're familiar with audio editing software, a lot of these probably look familiar, and if not, then I encourage you to play around with them yourself and see what each of them does. Anyways, for now, let's just pick the multiband EQ to see how this works. We'll also loop the event so we can hear it over and over again while we play with the effects, and we'll see that as we play around with the settings on the multiband EQ, the sound changes accordingly. You might be asking the question though, why add effects to the audio in FMOD when that could instead be done in a more powerful audio editing software? The answer to that is by adding effects in FMOD we can parameterize them and then therefore control parts of that effect from the game code. You'll notice that when we play around with this EQ, the two values here are changing. Anytime we see a value like this in FMOD, we can usually parameterize it in a way that our game can influence what those values are, and thereby make the audio adaptive to whatever's happening in the game. To add a parameter, we can go to Window, Preset Browser, and then click New parameter in this window that pops up. We'll call this one EQ, keep it as a value from 0 to 1, and then leave the rest of the values here as defaults. Then we can hit OK and then exit out of the preset browser. Then for our multiband EQ effect, for the frequency value, we can right click in that box, select Add Automation, and then click Add Curve. And then we'll just go to Browse and select the EQ parameter that we just created. There's now an EQ parameter that shows up on the top here, and we can move that value between 0 and 1. And as we do that, we'll also see this white vertical line go across the automation section of our effect, where the value of our parameter hits a point on this red line here. Right now, the curve is constant, so there's no change in the effect. However, we can click and add points to change the curve to be somewhat linear. And now, if we play it and adjust that parameter, we can see that the parameter is directly controlling the frequency of the multiband EQ. Likewise, we could do the same thing with this other value here using that same parameter, or of course we could use a different parameter if we wanted to, and it's important to understand that parameters can be applied to pretty much any changeable value in FMOD, which is one of the things that makes FMOD so powerful when it comes to adaptive audio. The last thing I want to show regarding parameters is the parameter sheet in the event. We can add a new sheet by clicking this plus button and selecting add parameter sheet for the EQ parameter, and then we'll delete the timeline sheet we previously had just so it doesn't get in the way. It's a bit strange to understand how this works at first, but in a parameter sheet, the top value in the sheet is no longer related to time, but instead corresponds to the parameter's value. So if we drag in a sound and position it somewhere, the location of our cursor when we play the event actually corresponds to the EQ parameter and has nothing to do with with time. And if the cursor isn't hovering over the instrument, it won't play it at all, which makes the parameter sheet a great option if playing an instrument is dependent on the value of a parameter. And of course, you can stretch out the instrument so it covers whatever parameter values you want it to. And last, the parameter sheet can be used in addition to the other types of sheets in an event, but of course you can't have multiple parameter sheets for the same parameter in the same event. And that's it for the parameter sheet, so now we're going to go back to using a timeline sheet and we'll drag back in the UI cancel sound and put the EQ parameter all the way to 1. So now let's say that this event has been set up just like we want it to be and we're ready to try it out in our game. Right now the game code wouldn't be able to see it because it's not assigned to a bank, hence the unassigned tag. As mentioned previously in the video, a bank is just a collection of events of some similar type. Part of this is just how you want to organize your events, however banks do allow you to choose what content is loaded into memory at any given time. So especially if you're working on a larger project with lots of audio or have memory constraints for some other reason, it's worth keeping that in mind when it comes to organizing your banks. There always needs to be a master bank, which is marked as master, which contains data about the entire FMOD project, and it's something you wouldn't want to delete. We can create a new bank by right-clicking and selecting New Bank, and we'll just call this one SFX. Back in the Events tab, we're going to rename this event to UI Cancel, just so we know what the event represents, and then we can assign this event to a bank by right-clicking it, assign to bank, browse, and then select the SFX bank we created. We'll see that the unassigned tag goes away, and then back in the Banks tab, we'll also see that the event shows up under 
under the SFX bank. So at this point, we could build the project and the game could interact with the event we created. But before we do that, let's talk about how we would go about volume control and mixing for an FMOD project. We can go to Window, Mixer, which will pop open the Mixer window. Under the Routing tab, we can see that there's a master bus and under that we have any events in our project, which in this case is only the one. A bus essentially breaks the mixer into different sections in which we can group events under and then apply volume control or even effects to all of the events in that group. The master bus covers everything, so if we change the volume here, it'll change the volume for everything in the project. To create a new group, or also referred to as a group bus, we can right click on the master bus and then select new group, which we'll call SFX. Now if we add any events to that group by dragging them in, we can control the volume for those using the group's volume slider in addition to the master volume slider. When setting this section up, it's good to consider this in a couple of ways. First, what volume controls will the game have? Most games have settings to turn the volume up or down for music, ambience, and sound effects all separately, so we might want to have groups for each one of those things. Doing so gives an easy way for the game code to alter the volume for those sound types, since your game code will be able to access these group buses. The second thing to consider is simply how you want to organize this for mixing the sound in the project. While the game code may not care about this, you could create groups within those groups to organize your events further, for example having separate mixing options for sounds related to the player character, the UI, and so on. Next, if we wanted to bundle together some of these groups for volume control, we could do that with what's called a VCA. For example, if we wanted a volume slider that controlled the volume for both music and ambience, we can right click, select new VCA, and call it music and ambience. Then back in the routing tab, we can right click on the music group, assign to VCA, and then select the VCA we just created. And of course, we'll do that for the ambience group as well so that both are assigned to that VCA. And then the slider for that VCA would now control the volume for both of those groups. Back in the routing tab, you might have also noticed this reverb here, which is what's called a return bus. We can create a new return bus by right clicking on the master bus and then selecting new return. But for now, we'll just stick with the reverb return that was already there. A return bus works a bit differently in which instead of grouping events under it, you actually have an event run through it. So for example, if we wanted to send the UI cancel event through the return bus, we could click on the event and then down here, we can right click, add send to mixer, and then select the reverb return. Returns can be a bit strange to understand if you're not familiar with audio engineering, and I'm not going to fully explain how they work in this video, but the gist of what's happening here is that the send is duplicating our audio signal, where the duplication is only the effect, and then we can mix those signals together using that return bus. And last, there might be points in the game where you want the mix to be different and therefore need to manage multiple mixes. This can be accomplished by using snapshots. So we'll select the snapshots tab, and then by right clicking in here and creating a new overriding snapshot, it'll capture what our mix looks like at the moment. We'll do one snapshot for a normal mix, and then another snapshot for a mix where we're underwater in the game. And then while clicked on the underwater mix, we can adjust things accordingly to make it sound like we're underwater by lowering some of the volume levels. And then with the master bus selected, we can also add an effect to change the EQ on everything, and we can even run it through our reverb return bus. And now that we have a couple of snapshots set up, we can trigger these in a couple of ways. The first would be from our game code, and the second would be straight from an event. Back in the UI cancel event, we'll create a new instrument, choose snapshot, and then pick the underwater mix and put that on its own track. And just for comparison, I copied over the instrument where the first one will be using the default mix and the second one will use the underwater mix. This is because when the second instrument plays, the cursor will be over the snapshot instrument. And finally, if we want our game to actually be able to do something with this project, we should first save it somewhere, and then we can go to File, Build, which compiles each bank down into a build folder of the project. And these compiled bank files are what the game will actually interact with through the FMOD API. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully this video gave you enough information to get started with your own FMOD project. If you found it to be helpful, please give it a thumbs up so more people see it. And I do plan on making more content around FMOD and other game development topics, so be sure to subscribe as well if that interests you. Doing so helps out this channel, and I really appreciate it. You're also welcome to come by my Discord server, which is a great place to hang out whether you're just learning about game development, working on a passion project, or just want to share what you're working on, which I'd love to see. I'm also creating a game myself, which I'm using FMOD for, and you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok if you'd like to follow along with that. Anyways, thanks again for watching, and I hope this was helpful.